Hello, my name is Jeremy Collins. I'm the director of conferences and symposia here at the National World War II Museum's Jenny Craig Institute for the Study of War and Democracy. To commemorate the annual Gold Star Mothers and Families Day, we have a great program in store for you. It will be moderated by my friend and colleague, Dr. Steph Hennerschitz, who is a senior historian here at the Museums Institute and is the author of three books, her latest being an award winner, The Japanese American Incarceration, The Camps and Coerced Labor During World War II, was the winner of the 2022 Philip Taft Labor History Award. Steph received her PhD from the University of Maryland in 2013 and has held various teaching positions before coming to the World War II Museum last year. She will be introducing our speaker and moderating the conversation. So Steph, take it away. All right, thank you, Jeremy. And thank you, Allison, for being here tonight. So I wanna give everyone a little bit of background about my fellow UMD graduate and friend, Dr. Allison S. Finkelstein, who earned her PhD in US history from UMD. She currently serves as a historian with the US Army and previously worked for the US Citizenship and Immigration Services History Office and Library as well as the American Battle Monuments Commission. Her first book, which we'll be talking about tonight, Forgotten Veterans, Invisible Memorials, How American Women Commemorated the Great War 1917 to 1945, was published by the University of Alabama Press in August of 2021. From 2017 and 2018, the Arlington County Board of Virginia appointed her as the chair of the Arlington World War I Commemoration Task Force. So obviously she is incredibly knowledgeable about the topic we're gonna to be discussing this evening. And if you wanna learn more about her and her work, you can go to allisonfinkelstein.com and I can also share that link later on as well. So thank you so much, Allison, for being here with us. Steph, thank you so much for that wonderful and really humbling introduction. It really is, an honor to be speaking with the museum tonight. I want to thank you and I want to thank Jeremy Collins for hosting me, inviting me, and for putting all of this work into this program. And I just want to say it's such a special treat and really rewarding to be able to do one of these programs with a friend and fellow graduate of the same PhD program. So I think we've come full circle and that's really fantastic. I also just want to mention another reason why speaking at the museum is really actually very personally special to me. My grandfather was wounded on D-Day. He was a member of the U.S. Navy, and when this museum was still known as the National D-Day Museum, he actually donated some of his World War II photos and an oral history to the collection. And at that time in his life, he was still not talking about his experiences in the war that much. So this was something that he was really proud of and I think that it opened up a lot of reminiscences from him that he ended up sharing with my father and me so it, it just feels like a great way to give back because I know that meant a lot to him to have that in your collection so just a, another sort of personal connection to share here and one of the ways that the National World War II Museum has impacted so many people and so many families. Awesome, thank you. And so we always do like to talk about what's the connection to World War II here. So you obviously have a very personal, but also a professional connection as well. Yeah, so thank you for sharing that with us. So if it's okay with you, I'm just gonna jump in and start asking you some questions about your book. And so to help our audience learn a little bit more about it and then also hopefully buy it. So I do have a copy here, <laughs> which we will have a, a link to that as well. One of the most interesting things that I always wanna know about whenever I talk with a historian and an author is how he or she came to this topic. So this is a very recent book. It's looking at something that I think many of our viewers might be familiar with, World War I and World War II, but it's also, it's different. It presents a unique perspective and it's a story that many might not know of. So what, what was it about this particular topic of, women, gold star mothers, remembering World War I through World War II, anything that has to do with these topics, what about it drew you to this book? Thank you. That I think is one of the most fun topics to talk about when you've actually gotten a book out. So I, I will get to answering your question. I just have to delay us for one quick 30 second disclaimer break. Um, so I just have to share with everybody in my day job, I work as a historian for the US Army, but this presentation tonight, my book, it's completely separate from my job. I'm in no way representing the US Army. 
or the federal government. So everything you're hearing tonight, it's just my own opinions and separate. So thank you all for bearing with me as I do my due diligence with that. But let's get back to the questions. So I think most authors will probably tell you this is a roundabout story that involves a couple twists and turns. And my story with this book is no different. It began when I spent a year in between college and graduate school teaching at a boarding school in England as a teaching assistant. And during that year, I really became embedded in British commemorative culture, mostly surrounding the First World War. We did entire modules on the First World War with our students who were middle school, high school, secondary school age. Um, we did Remembrance Day, Remembrance Sunday, Armistice Day, actual commemorations at the school with the entire student body. We wore the British Legion poppy pin throughout November. And then most importantly, I actually got to help chaperone our students on a field trip to the Western Front. So there I was, this young American out in Flanders, in Ypres, in the Somme with a bunch of British teenagers and my wonderful colleagues, my fellow history teachers who remain my good friends to this day. And we traveled all around to these sites. We got to lay a wreath at the Menin Gate. We went to Commonwealth War Graves Commission cemeteries, and I really started to become fascinated and sucked in to the history of the First World War. But particularly, I started thinking about a question that really played into the creation of this book. How come it seemed to me at that time the British and the French remembered World War I so much more distinctly and so much more strongly than we did in the US. And in the course of writing this book, I keep coming back to that question, and it turned out to be a lot more complicated than I thought, but that's what started to drive me towards this topic. And then in graduate school, there were a couple other experiences which really led me towards focusing on World War I commemoration. I did a paper in a historic preservation class on architectural history where I started researching these little vernacular, simple craftsman buildings that were built at the World War I cemeteries for the Gold Star pilgrimages. And we'll talk about the pilgrimages later. I have some images of those buildings that we can share, but essentially they were government funded trips to take women whose sons, daughters, or spouses died in World War I and brought them to visit their graves. So I started studying these little, little rest houses on the cemeteries. And then at the time, I was spending some summers interning at the American Battle Monuments Commission. And that's the federal agency that is now in charge of all of the overseas World War I memorials, cemeteries, and World War II cemeteries and memorials. So most famously, of course, they run the Normandy American Cemetery. But when we were interning at the time, um, we actually got to spend two weeks in France doing field work. And we focused a lot of that time at the New Sargon American Cemetery and really got to explore the battle areas, the landscape there, and find ourselves enmeshed in what American commemoration looked like on the ground. Um, and I eventually was able to work there after graduate school, but it was that combination of interning at the ABMC, researching those rest houses, and then being intrigued by my experience in England, which eventually led me to decide to focus the dissertation on how American women commemorated World War I. And I have to give credit to another group of scholars. As a lot of you probably know, there's a really robust field of study about how American women commemorated the Civil War. And I really took that as an example that I could follow to look at some of those same questions, but apply them to women in America during World War I, many of whom were actually the granddaughters or even daughters in some cases of those women who commemorated the Civil War. I wanted to ask some of the same questions and see what I would come up with. Excellent. It's, it was really interesting to hear how you blended public history and scholarship with this book. I think that's something that's that's really interesting for any of our viewers to hear about, but also kind of non-traditional ways to come at a dissertation topic, sort of being there, experiencing it, and then working those big questions that you experienced or developed while sort of in the field, and then honing it more into what would eventually become your book out of your dissertation. So I want to go back to the last part of what you mentioned about the role of women in commemorating World War I, because that is 
primarily <laughs> the focus of your book. And it is a really fascinating angle, and especially the way that you you look at it. And a couple of questions about that later on, but tell us a little bit about who are the women in your book. So just, you know, kind of flesh them out for us a little bit, give a little bit of, of description about who these very remarkable women were. Right. So the book focuses on women who somehow served or sacrificed in the First World War. So I'm not talking about what they actually did during the war. I have lots of books I can recommend to read about that. We're looking at their post-war lives. And I defined this group really broadly. So obviously there's the people who you immediately think of in terms of women who served in World War I. Nurses, whether with the Red Cross, the Army Nurse Corps, the Navy Nurse Corps. Um, women who served in uniform and were very clearly out there as close to the front lines as they could be, whether that was in Europe or on the home front. But I also looked at women who served as civilians, whether they were paid employees, whether they were volunteers, whether they were somehow working in a strange in-between status. I wanted to get at all of the different ways that women served during the war. And then in terms of the sacrifice category, obviously a lot of those same women fit into that category, right? Women who sacrificed uh, their bodies, their mental health, who pursued this instead of maybe taking other paths in life. But I also wanted to look at women whose sacrifices were more familial. So women who lost a family member, maybe women who had a family member who came back very injured. Because what I ended up finding as I learned about these women and read their words was that a lot of the Gold Star women and others defined themselves as having sacrificed for the nation through their own personal tragedy. So they were actually saying, I too served, and I served because I, I lost this loved one. And they really wanted that to be recognized by the government. And that becomes very important in the book. Um, so we have those broad categories, but then of course in the book, I had to narrow it down because nobody wants to read 600 pages. So <laughs> I focused it on five distinct groups of women and each chapter covers one of those groups. So in the first chapter, we have the Women's Overseas Service League. And this was an organization of any woman who served overseas during World War I. And they basically acted like a veterans organization. Uh, they tried to support each other, they were patriotic, and this was important because a lot of these women were not eligible to join the American Legion or the Veterans of Foreign Wars, and we'll talk about why that was, I think, later. Um, but they ended up really becoming a leader of the community of women that I'm talking about. The second group of women is much more well known, I think, to some of our audience, and that's the women of the American Red Cross. So I look specifically at one project they did, and that's the creation of their memorial building to the women of the World War, which is a living memorial building in Washington, D.C. at their headquarters. And when I say living memorial, what I'm talking about is a utilitarian memorial. So it's beautiful. I can show some photos of it. It's made of marble. It has neoclassical columns, but inside it was actually meant for service activities. In the third chapter, I talk about another organization, and this one has a, a long name. It's called the World War I, the World War Reconstruction AIDS Association, WWRAA, which is a mouthful. Um, so they were a group of women who served as reconstruction aides, which was the contemporary term at the time for a physical or occupational therapist. And these women really had a tough time in the interwar period because they didn't have veterans benefits and we can chat about that. In the fourth chapter, I look at the American War Mothers, which was a group founded during the war to unite the mother of a service member. So it wasn't just Gold Star Mothers, it was any woman whose child was serving. And after the war, they really became focused on continuing their service through commemoration. And then finally, I look at those Gold Star pilgrimages and I analyze how that pilgrimage, that action, was actually a type of memorial. Um, but I, I do want to just take a minute to parse out what I keep alluding to, how some of these women were not able to get veterans benefits, how they weren't actually in the military. And this is where we have to step back for a minute and talk about how women served in World War I. And this is especially important when we get to the story of our World War II women, because this was the precursor 
for women's service in the Second World War. So in World War I, there was a very limited group of women who were actually considered full official military veterans. So that group included the Navy Yeoman F, the female Marines, and two women who served in the Coast Guard. There was a loophole that was discovered in the law that enabled the Secretary of the Navy to allow women to actually enlist. So these women were enlisted, and this was the first time in American history that women were actually enlisted in the military. And it was temporary, so they were taken out after the war, but it set a really important precedent. And then the other groups of women that were considered full veterans were the Army and Navy nurses. And that story gets a little bit more complicated because they were not enlisted officially. They also didn't have real rank and they didn't have equivalent status. It's, it's very complicated. They had relative rank. They didn't actually have authority over the men in their care, but they were still in the military. And if you're sitting there thinking, Allison, that really doesn't make any sense. It didn't make sense to the women at the time as well. And the whole system was very complicated, and we can talk about why that may have been. So those are the only women that would actually get veterans benefits. So all of these other women that I talk about in the book, the reconstruction aides, um, women who served as dietitians, most famously the Hello Girls, who were civilian telephone operators who worked for the Signal Corps, they were all serving as civilians, kind of the equivalent of a contractor today. So they were out there, oftentimes overseas, often in dangerous situations, and they got no veterans benefits. And it was very confusing to them at the time because many were serving in uniform. Many of them took an oath of office. Many of them were treated very similarly to men in the military, but they were not in the military. So after the war, they were really scrambling. They did not have the resources they needed to take care of themselves, and they ended up having to really take care of each other, which is a fascinating and I think really heartwarming story that is in the book. Yeah, you also really, you do a really great job in your book of looking at all these different groups and all these different groups of women and pulling them together. And one thing I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that touches on your point about women serving but not being seen as veterans. And that's this phrase that you have coined. And it's always great as a historian when you can coin a phrase or a term. It's, it's like you put your mark on something. So you developed this really fascinating term, veteranism, to use when you talk about the women and their activities in, in your book. So for anyone who might be interested in reading the book, Tell us a little bit more about this concept of veteranism, because I know when I hear the word veteran, I tend to automatically think of someone who served, but you're dealing with a group of women who don't really have access to that or that sort of recognition. So what is what is veteranism and how does this fit into to your story? So this word that I coined and created veteranism, I, I did it for a few reasons, and I want to give credit to Professor Severio Giovacchini at University of Maryland, who was the one who really encouraged me to do this, because after I define it, you'll understand it became very wordy at a certain point to keep re-explaining it during the book. So having a succinct term actually helps to just get it out there and move on without beating my readers over the head with what it means. So I do want to give him a little credit. But when I talk about veteranism, what I'm talking about is a distinct ideology, a philosophy towards approaching memorializations. And veteranism encompassed in this definition commemorations that placed the plight of male and female veterans at the center of memorialization projects. So what I mean is that the women I'm talking about in my book, they often said that instead of creating a statue or a physical monument, they would prefer to do an intangible service or advocacy project. And this is really tied to what we talked about a minute ago. These women were unrecognized veterans. So in their definition, they were including any kind of veteran as they understood it in the types of projects that they could pursue in support of veteranism. So in many ways, they were very impacted by the war. They wanted to try and find a way to repair the world. And a lot of them came back from their wartime experience 
thinking that just spending money on another statue was really not the best use of their limited funds or their limited time. They wanted to do something to help their communities. And this is really important when we think about women specifically because a lot of these women were pushed out of their types of service after the war. So by working on memorial projects that actually helped the nation, they were continuing their service. They were doing what women have done throughout US history. They were carving out a space for themselves in civic life. And in this case, a lot of times in national defense, making room for them to make an impact even when they were still barred from actually serving. So this helped them in a couple ways. It kept them active. It showed that they really took the idea of martial citizenship seriously, right? They believed that they could prove their citizenship and the new right to vote once we, we got the 19th Amendment by continuing their service. But it also had another aspect. These women realized pretty quickly that their service was being overlooked and they struggled to try and figure out how to get their stories in the historical narrative. So by branching out to different kinds of memorials that weren't necessarily tangible, they could do commemorative projects that actually helped to try and remind people that they also served. And I do wanna just make one caveat. You know, the women I'm talking about, they didn't always agree with each other. They had a lot of disagreements. They didn't always take the same perspective and they didn't always reject monuments and memorials. So it's not a story that's an A or a B. It's really a back and forth and they changed their minds and they tried to figure it out and they tried to experiment. Yeah, and that's something I definitely wanna come back to later on, some of the challenges that veteranists faced. But I did want to return to something you had mentioned earlier about the difference between what we might tend to think of as standard and more traditional memorials and monuments. You had already discussed a living memorial or a building that was meant to be used for something, which I think is becomes kind of a hallmark of these, of these women. But what are some examples of what you would identify going through the archives, looking at and saying, this is a very much like a veteranist memorial. So what are some of the examples that might be different from what our viewers would think of when they think of what a monument or memorial is? So a lot of these memorialization projects were community service based. So for example, I think the Women's Overseas Service League really represents this the most clearly because they were the group that took the strongest, most radical stance in pursuing veteranism. So for example, um, instead of spending money on sending each other Christmas cards, they would encourage their members to actually make donations to their Fund for Disabled Overseas Women, which was a form of social welfare that they created themselves to help provide financial aid to women who needed help but couldn't get it because they were not an actual veteran. So they said, don't send a Christmas card, make a donation, and then we'll print a greeting in our newsletter so your friends can see that you're thinking of them at Christmas. And this is especially important during the Great Depression. Even then, these women were trying to think of thrifty ways they could help each other even when their own funds were low. Um, and I think one of the most clear ways to say it is the quote that really helped coalesce this for me when I was researching. I think a lot of historians have that moment in the archives where you find that one source that just helps bring it all together. This is that source. And it's the president of the Women's Overseas Service League, Louise Wells, in 1920. And she said, quote, there was an overwhelming sentiment to the effect that for the present at least, our best memorial to the dead would be our service to the living. So these women even defined things like hospital work, supporting blinded veterans, um, even just helping their fellow sisters. They considered that to all be a type of memorial. And this even included advocacy work. So all of their work to lobby Congress to try, mostly unsuccessfully, to get them some benefits they saw that as the best way to commemorate the war. Yeah, there was, so for any of our viewers who are watching, and I, I brought this up with you already, Allison, but it rem there was one example you gave of women who worked to make masks for veterans who had been disfigured during the war. And so if anyone watches Boardwalk Empire, there's a character who has one of these masks. And I remember, I'm like, 
oh, that's one of Allison's masks that she talked about in her book. So again, if anyone has seen that, that's an example that um, Allison does discuss in her book. So this all sounds great. I mean, it sounds very inspiring. These women wanted to take memorialization in a different route. I mean, make it more useful might not be the right word, but at least something kind of more tangible than looking at a monument or memorial. But what were some of the challenges that this movement faced? What were, what were things that just made it more difficult for these women to be able to fully carry out the missions that they wanted to accomplish? So I actually think useful is the right word to describe these types of memorials. And sometimes these women would even use it themselves. And it's that usefulness that actually became one of the drawbacks because when they were doing all of these useful memorial projects, they weren't actually leaving anything for posterity to see what they were doing, right? These were ephemeral. They were based in their own human actions. So there's not a lot of evidence today that we can see in our cities and towns about what these women did, right? I think maybe some of you have a World War I memorial in the city or the town where you live. Maybe it's a Doughboy statue. Maybe there's a roll of honor. It's usually created by the VFW or the American Legion that creates this picture that those male organizations were the main ones doing commemoration. But in fact, you had all of these women working around the country to commemorate the war. But because they chose to do these veteranist type of projects, we can't really see it anymore. Um, so that's really a big drawback. And I don't think it takes away from what they did, but it gives us a lot today to think about when we think about applying this type of veteranism to our monuments today, right? It makes us wonder like, how are we impacting our own landscape? What are we sending in our messages to the future? Um, what are the benefits, right? The, the pros and cons. And so I, I leave that to you all in the audience to think about because it's something I've been contemplating a lot over the past few years. Because really what these women were doing was they were doing something a lot more selfless. They were not putting themselves in front of it. So you're not going to find that plaque that talks about the Women's Overseas Service League. And, you know, if we were in a, an audience hall at the museum today, I would ask you, raise your hand if you've heard about the Women's Overseas Service League. And I would be thrilled and shocked if anybody would raise their hand. So they really faded into the background. And when combined with the fact that they were already struggling to get recognition for their own service, in many ways, they made it even more difficult for people to know what they did. But I mean, the other thing we have to talk about takes us back to that main question that I mentioned when I talked about the inspiration for the book. Why did it seem to me that the U.S. was not as invested in World War I commemoration? Well, I, I argue that the U.S. was very invested, but it just wasn't always as visible. So this type of commemoration, it hides the scale of how deeply a war impacted um, this country or any country. And I think it gives an impression that's not necessarily accurate to what people were doing at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and this is a question that I, I just thought of in listening to you talk about the different challenges that the women faced and that we actually face today in remembering World War I here and how we remember it. What kind of ways can we, can we look and see? Do we see any memorials? How many do we see? And I know I certainly have not heard much about the, the women that you mentioned until I read your book. But at the time when these women are sort of lobbying, organizing, trying to get everything together to do some sort of useful memorialization, who were their who were their main supporters? Were there groups beyond just, you know, the other women's groups who were supporting them? I guess a follow-up question, if I could tack this on, would be, are there or were there any surprising supporters, people who you're like, oh, that's interesting that they got behind these women. You might not necessarily think that they would. There were actually a lot of men who supported these women. And I, I just want to make clear that women were not the only people doing veteranism and they didn't invent it. There was a precedent from previous years. A lot of this is rooted in progressivism um, and things like that. But they got a lot of support from the American Legion. Um, in many ways, the Women's Overseas Service League, as an example, saw themselves as sort of a sister organization to the American Legion. Um, the American War Mothers also worked closely with those male veterans organizations. So even though a lot of these women weren't allowed to join, 
they did work together and they had they did have a good amount of support and recognition um, they were able to often get messages of support from the president of the US um, for their conventions. So they were very, very active. And I think once we get to World War II, which I, I promise everybody we will get to, we will see how much of an impact these women had behind the scenes. But it all got so overshadowed and their service, again, because it wasn't always official, did not stand out the way the service of men oftentimes would, right? It's very easy to note a member of Congress who served in World War I, but members of Congress, like a woman, we're gonna talk about Edith Norse Rogers, right? She served, but she didn't serve in the military. She was with the YMCA and the American Red Cross. So when you're thinking about these definitions of service, their service got lost. But I guess to think about your question of who's the most interesting supporter, I don't know if it's one person or one group, but it's just the multitude of military leaders that these women were able to get either to talk at their conventions or to send them messages of support. And even times some of them would write to General Pershing, he would write back. Um, you know, they were they were not unheard of at the time and they did have a lot of allies, but that just wasn't strong enough and it wasn't sufficient to really get them the kind of support they needed in government to get their veterans benefits. And I do think there's a gendered aspect to that as we'll get to with World War II. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and like Allison said, we are getting into World War II. <laughs> we will get there. Um, the next question I, I wanna ask because this is sort of commemorating Gold Star Mothers and Family Day. So they do play a role in your book. So this group, can you talk a little bit about Gold Star Mothers and how they do factor into this story of veteranism and your, your overall narrative that you discuss here? Right, so during World War I, this is when we actually get this symbol of the gold star that's used to indicate an American who has lost a loved one. And the gold star mothers and widows, they really become the most well-known of this really tragic community. And a lot of that has to do with mother's roles at the time. The mother was very much lauded and venerated in American culture as being a noble part of society who served the country by sending her son or husband, but usually son, off to serve in the military. So mothers were seen as having this very special feminine role in national defense. And that's why the gold star mothers are really the ones who we talk about the most, even though there were gold star fathers, right, as well. So they became a very strong lobbying group. They formed some associations. They were supported by the American War Mothers. And they believed that because their loss signified a type of national service that they deserved and had earned special benefits from the government. And what they really focused on was a trip paid for by the government, a pilgrimage to these overseas cemeteries. So just to back up, during World War I, this was the first time that the U.S. gave families, known as next of kin, the choice of whether to leave their loved one buried in an overseas military cemetery, the first of their kind for the U.S., or to repatriate them, to bring them home. So the mothers and widows that chose to leave them in those cemeteries, they believed that they had done a special service, right, above and beyond because by placing their loved one's body there, they were playing into an American story of military impact and diplomacy in Europe. This was really the US staking its claim for what the country had contributed during World War I. So they're actually able by 1929 to get congressional support for this. And even during the height of the depression, 1930 to 1933, these pilgrimages went on. So I'll just, um, Share my screen for a minute here so you can see some images to help you understand this. Um, here we have an image of one of the African American gold star mothers at Seren American Cemetery. So you can see that she's kneeling at the grave of her loved one. And this really demonstrates the powerful emotional impact of these pilgrimages. And it's significant that this photo is of an African-American pilgrim because the pilgrimages were segregated and segregation did impact the women that I'm talking about. 
and the government decided to send the black mothers and black widows on separate trips. And there was a lot of controversy about that that we can talk about, but I wanted to make sure to include this photo here because this is a mother or a widow whose loved one died serving in a segregated army. And here she is on a segregated trip. And then in this image, this is that rest house that I was talking about earlier. So this is no longer at San Mihal American Cemetery. It was only put up during the Gold Star Pilgrimage. But this photo really shows you right there with those crosses, those gravestones, is this little building that kind of looks like a craftsman bungalow. Maybe it kind of looks like a country club building from the time. It looks like something that's been picked up from the US and placed in France. And these buildings were specifically created to try and make these women feel comfortable, to give them a sense of emotional support, a little taste of home as they were on these really, really difficult trips. Um, so when I looked at those buildings, what I was trying to say is that these buildings and even the trips themselves were a type of veteranist memorial, right? They were intangible. They weren't created of anything, but they were meant to memorialize these women's sacrifices as well as their loved ones. And in this case, the women asked the government for this and the government gave it to them. So the government was engaging in a type of veteranist commemoration through these pilgrimages, through these trips. And I think this is really significant because when we think about the Gold Star women, they had a very strong impact on policy at the time. They were actually shaping what the government was spending its money on. They were very involved in commemoration, um, all sorts of different ceremonies and participation, especially at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So these women saw themselves as more than just grieving mothers. They saw them as, ha as having a role to play in shaping how the country remembered the war. Yeah, and I, I just have a, a follow-up question because I do want to go back to the, we don't have to pull it up again, but I do want to return to the image you showed of the African-American Gold Star Mother. So when you're talking about how the women envisioned what they were doing with their veteranism, having an impact on policy, and this was something more than just an emotional sort of sacrifice or recognizing emotional sacrifice. And then there are the congressmen and politicians and the military leaders who supported them. What do you, I mean, was there a difference between how the women viewed themselves versus how these predominantly male authority figures viewed what they were doing? I'm just, I'm curious to hear about that. Was there any friction between these two, these two sides and veteranism? So for the pilgrimages, we'll talk about that first because that's a distinct group, right? Because the, the pilgrims were not saying that they were veterans. They did not define themselves like that. Um, I think that the government saw the pilgrims as very much needing to be coddled a bit. And you see this in the correspondence and the documentation from the Army's Quartermaster Corps. They were the organization within the Army that was tasked with running this program because they had earlier in the war taken care of graves registration. So there's this real sense that these women were very fragile, um, that they had to be taken care of, you had to watch for their health, and some of them were. Some of them were quite old at the time. But especially for the widows, a lot of the widows weren't very old. So there was a bit of a tension between the government's sense of needing to take care of these women, and on the other hand, these women lobbying and saying, take us on this trip. These aren't the words that they used, but they were insinuating that they could not only handle this, but it was necessary for their grieving process. And then for the other women, the women that were calling these unrecognized veterans, there was much more of a tension because they would often say things like, we were veterans too, and they weren't being recognized that way by the government especially. And yes, they would be commemorated. Yes, they would be included. Yes, right, the American Legion would support them. But at the end of the day, most of them did not actually get that official recognition. That was just a step too far to call all of these women military veterans. And this is really where the fight starts for those World War II women that we'll talk about. It's trying to move past that barrier 
and ensure that the women of the next generation would be able to be considered not even on an equal status with men. I think they, they knew that wasn't going to happen, but at least to get some sort of recognition and veterans benefits. Yeah, great. Um, thank you for, for taking that a little bit little bit more in depth. And I, I promise I will come back to the picture of the African-American Gold Star mother, but this does set up really nicely the flow kind of into World War II. So I did, the, the big question I, I have for you is what did change during after World War II for this idea of veteranism? Things changed, but then things didn't change. And I wanna talk first about what didn't change. What did not change was this community of women remained dedicated, if not more committed to veteranism during World War II. So they really saw this as an opportunity to pitch in, to show that they were so committed to this ideology and to their national service. So a lot of these women, they tried to join up again. Some of them actually did serve again during World War II. Others were restricted by their age and they tried to get around that. When they couldn't get around that, they would serve in other ways, such as with the American Red Cross, but they really went all in with supporting service members, veterans, and women during the Second World War. Um, and, and sometimes it was actually at a detriment to themselves. So the World War Reconstruction Aids Association, those physical and occupational therapists, in their correspondence, they talked about how they were so busy supporting the war effort that they actually stopped doing as much for their own organization. And after World War II, they ended up dissolving. Um, and part of it, by their own admission, was because they had just lost steam. They were so focused on supporting World War II that they ended up in, in a sort of selfless way harming their own organization. So I can talk about different examples of what they did during World War II, but I think what I, I want to talk about more, if it's okay with you, are the two major impacts that these women from World War I made on the World War II generation. Yeah, no, that's great because we like we'll let everyone else read the book. <laughs> they want to learn more. So yeah, go ahead. So these World War I women, they were in all sorts of places during World War II. And one of them in particular became extremely influential. And that was Representative Edith Norse Rogers. And I talked about her a little bit before. She served overseas with the Red Cross, the YMCA. She was in Congress and she ended up spearheading or helping to spearhead two major initiatives. And that's the creation of the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps and later the Women's Army Corps and the GI Bill. So what I argue in the book is that you have this ideology of veteranism as led by World War I women that really shaped two important parts of World War II. So let's start first with the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. And this is where you'll have to bear with us. This gets a little confusing. So first we have the W-A-A-C, which is pronounced the WAC, and it's the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, but it's different than the WAC, the W-A-C, the Women's Army Corps. So if you're with me, right now we're just talking about the W-A-A-C. And that extra A in that acronym is really important because it meant auxiliary which indicated that this was actually not within the U.S. Army. It was an auxiliary, which meant that these women did not have military status and they were not considered veterans. So this was proposed by Edith Norse Rogers in 1941, and she intended originally for it not to be an auxiliary. But she received a lot of backlash from Congress, and she could not get it through as anything other than an auxiliary. And she was inspired to even start this attempt from her experiences in World War I. And she actually talks about this in the hearings, in the documentation, that she did not want the next generation of women to be in the same position as those World War I women. And she and her other women from the Women's Overseas Service League, of which she was a member, they didn't give up. They accepted the fact that it had to be an auxiliary because they said it was better than nothing, but they kept pushing. And that's why we get the Women's Army Corps, the WAC WAC, later on in the war. And that's when women are finally allowed in the U.S. Army as actual members of the Army. And all of this in the testimonies, in the documentation, it's all being brought back 
to these World War I women and their experiences. And a lot of these World War I women knew that by this point they were probably not going to be successful in getting their own veterans benefits, but they didn't, they didn't even let that stop them. They just wanted to make sure that the next generation of women would have more benefits. And as I think a lot of you know, this had lasting effects. The Women's Army Corps was in place through the 1970s, so really not that long ago. And it comes directly from Edith Norris Rogers and her supporters in this larger women's World War I veteranist community. And I think their perseverance is such an important part of that story. So I'll pause there in case you want to take that apart anymore before we talk about the GI Bill. Yeah, great. That's I love the direct connection. I think that's something that every historian wants to find. <laughs> is there a direct connection? In your case, there absolutely is between the women from World War One and then this sort of new era of veteranism in World War Two. So yeah, tell us about the GI Bill, because this is also really fascinating. I think our, our viewers would love to hear about the connection in your work between World War One and World War Two through this particular example. This story again comes back to Edith Norse Rogers. So she was the ranking minority member of the House of Representatives World War Veterans Legislation Committee. So this was a, a fairly significant role. And in that position, she helped to spearhead the GI Bill, which is technically called the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944. And I think a lot of you are probably familiar with it, but just to make sure everybody's on the same page, right? It created benefits for veterans when they returned from World War II. Things like loans for houses, businesses, farms, educational benefits. Um, my own grandfather, not the D-Day veteran, but the Army veteran, he went to college when he came home from World War II using the GI Bill. So this gave a lot of benefits to veterans. And Edith Norse Rogers, an unrecognized veteran of World War I, collaborated on it with several recognized male veterans of World War I. And when I figured this out and I started diving into it, it seemed to me that what this bill was doing was essentially veteranism. It was creating a benefit for these service members that recognized their contributions and helped them. And with Edith Norris Rogers right there at the helm, it lines up directly with this ideology. And I'm just going to share my screen briefly for one moment because I want to show you a picture here. Hopefully you can see it. Let me pull that up. So this is a picture of FDR signing the GI Bill and here you can see Edith Norse Rogers, the only woman in the photo with that beautiful big black hat leaning and peering over FDR's shoulder with an interest, a look that kind of, to me, seems like a mix of interest and glee. Um, so here she is, right? This really, to me, visualizes what these women were trying to do. They were trying to get a place at the table or the president's desk, in this case, to get this ideology into action in the U.S. And when we're thinking about World War II, right, the GI Bill has such big impacts on our country, of course, right, we have to, we have to note that the GI Bill was not equally applied to all veterans, especially veterans of color, and there's been a lot of great research about that, but it still impacted an entire generation. Maybe many of you out there in our virtual audience also have a relative who was impacted by it. And it got me thinking as I worked on the book how did the GI Bill change what these World War II veterans did when they came home? And this is, this is just me thinking here, um, something that I've tossed over in my head that has been backed up by um, some conversations with World War II veterans during honor flights to Washington, D.C. I would ask them, and I'd bring my students actually to meet them, what were you, what were you doing after the war? Why didn't you want a World War II memorial? And they would often say, I was so busy. I had a GI Bill. I got to go to college. I was working on my business. I was rebuilding my life, right? They were using all of the benefits that the GI Bill gave them and working on their futures rather than thinking about their past. And in talking to some of these World War II veterans on the honor flights, 
a lot of them gave that as a reason that they didn't even think about the lack of a National World War II memorial in D.C. until many years later. So even though the, the National World War II memorial in this example, it's a very traditional type of memorial, right, it came much later than some of the more tangible World War I memorials came. And of course, they're not always equivalent because a lot of those World War I memorials were local. This was national, and there's many examples overseas of national memorials to World War I in the U.S., but it just makes you stop and think when veteranism is put into action, how does it impact that returning generation of veterans? Yeah, and we really could think of the GI Bill in a different way after hearing you speak on the topic and also in your book. We could think of that as a memorial in and of itself if we reframe it with your idea of veteranism. So I think that's a, a really fascinating new way of looking at the GI Bill, where it came from. And of course, we can only understand that by understanding the role of these women. So I want to come back to something that you mentioned about the, uh, the GI Bill, and that was the inequality and who was able to benefit from it and who wasn't. So that got me thinking about when you mentioned the African-American Gold Star mother and showed the photo, were there were there other points of friction between Black women and white women or other groups within the broader movement of veteranism itself? Yes, there definitely were, and it varied by organization. So the American War Mothers, they had a really contentious uh, debate about segregation, and it was fascinating to read through the minutes of this debate because there were women from places like California who were saying that the black women should be allowed as members equally, while other women, a lot of times from the South, were very much against this. So what they ended up doing is they basically didn't make a decision. They just said it would be up to the individual chapters. So I was able to find evidence of several segregated chapters, especially quite active black chapters in Kentucky, but also Washington, D.C. and Chicago. Um, so these women were segregated in many places, but still allowed into the organization. And the book goes into more detail about that. Um, but I, I do just want to mention that those Kentucky chapters of African-American war mothers, a lot of them were reorganized during World War II and became even more active during World War II because the American war mothers allowed that generation of mothers to join their organization. So we see a much stronger representation, at least in Kentucky. And it was really quite hard to track down these African-American chapters. So there may be more out there. If, if anybody finds one, find me on my website, send it to me. I would love to know. Um, but again, right, when we're talking about social history, a lot of times those records of those organizations are not saved or they're a lot harder to find. With the Women's Overseas Service League, this is where it takes us back to World War I. For the most part, African-American women were not really allowed to serve overseas during the war. So I say for the most part because there were at least three Black women who historians have been able to identify as serving overseas, and they were not in the military, right? So not allowed to be overseas with the military. They were with the YMCA. Um, so there were only three. And more of them went overseas after the war, so that would still count for the Women's Overseas Service League for membership. But in their constitution, even with maybe a couple handfuls of Black women eligible, they still wrote in there that the women had to be segregated. So we see the segregation stemming from the war itself, but then filtering down to that organization who had to explicitly say that even though there were so few women eligible. And then of course, the segregation of the Gold Star pilgrimages, and there's been a lot of great research about that as well. It is a corollary to the segregation of the military during World War I, and then of course in World War II as well. Yeah, awesome. So I, I do really like how you take all these different groups, all these different regions, and bring them all together, together in this story. And I think the final question I want to ask you is a big one. So I'm not asking you to like solve all the problems or to have a sort of definitive answer to this. But what can, if someone picks up your book and reads about how World War I was commemorated and remembered during World War II by these women, what what might that tell us or your readers about how we think of, remember, memorialize World War II today? 
The biggest thing is that we have to think about World War II as an intergenerational conflict. It really was not that far separated in time from World War I. And I think that when we look at the biographies of a lot of the famous military leaders, right, um, and even presidents, right, when we think about President Truman who served in World War I, there's a lot more talked about served in World War I, served in World War II. But that intergenerational aspect of it was not just for the famous men. It really filtered down throughout society, right? Regular service members, but also in, in the case of what we're talking about tonight, these women. So World War I was so fresh in the minds of these Americans that to understand World War II, but especially how it was commemorated, we have to look back a little bit at least into World War I. So when we're talking about the overseas cemeteries, the American Battle Monuments Commission created a whole new program of World War II cemeteries after that conflict. We would not have those without the First World War. We would not um, understand them the same way without Eisenhower, who actually worked doing history for the ABMC um, in the 1920s, right? So there's all of these connections between that commemoration. And I think the other thing we need to think about is that it's sometimes really easy to count the memorials or be wowed by a very monumental grand structure and think that's representative of how a conflict was commemorated, whether that's World War I, World War II, the Civil War, any conflict. But what I learned from these women, from their words and from their actions, was that there's so much more to it than just the memorials. And we can't judge the impact of a war on society just by looking at those memorials. And I think that really changes how we think about World War II commemoration also, right? What about the more localized aspects? What about the things that veterans were doing or even still doing today for those of them who are still with us? Yeah, I, I liked your emphasis on intergenerational. And then also going back to this idea of veteranism, how not everything, every form of commemoration will be something you can point at or count. I also really like that. And it makes me think of here at the museum with the intergenerational aspect, we have, I believe quite a few of our own volunteers are Vietnam veterans. And so it's just really interesting to see this idea that you're talking about in your book, really come into practice with these group of veterans who served during a different war, but they're here because they're dedicated to this museum and they want to commemorate the memory of people who served before them. So I, I do really like the message of your book and I think it is reflected when we walk through the halls of the museum for visitors who have been here. If you see one of our volunteers, there's a good chance that they are also a veteran. And maybe if you know you do come back to the museum and you visit, you can think of Allison's book and everything that it it sheds light on when it comes to how we think about World War II. So I want to thank you again, Allison, for being with us here and connecting your work with what we do at the museum and also just hinting or, or touching on what we do here at the Institute, which is a study for war and democracy broadly. And your book really did a great job of that. So thank you. Oh, thank, thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity. And there's, there's lots more I could say. So hopefully you will read the book and just want to encourage you as you're thinking about unrecognized veterans, think about the unrecognized female veterans from World War II also, right? And you can learn about them at the museum, the women's Air Force service pilots, the U.S. Cadet Nurse Corps, women who really were not recognized and were still in a similar situation to those World War I women. Yeah, absolutely.